bringing us this afternoon. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. I think, well, this morning where Amy is in LA and this afternoon with Layla uh, for the Fund for Independent Journalism. Um, these are times of heartbreak and hope. Um, you're gonna meet two journalists who cover very, very tough, rough um, arenas and have for many years and have an expertise. I wanted to say a word about the intern program, however, both are graduates, Amy, class of 1978, she was in the first group and Layla was just telling us how remarkable her class is, was 2006. Um, and the internship was, I think, a journalistic political boot camp. Um, it was for me, I, uh, but it was a chance to uh, do work, get clippings, which is important for journalists, but also be part of the nation, which, I think it was a hundred and some years, 150 when Amy was around and 150, but it's a place of inspiration. It's a place of hope. It's a place of history. And I think both Amy and Layla are probably informed by the history, not only of the nation, but of the countries and the arenas they report on. Amy was um, and remains a contributing editor, longtime contributing editor. Um, she always scared me. She was assistant literary editor and assistant editor, and she's sort of famous for uh, persuading Victor Navasky to do an unsigned lead about uh, John Lennon, uh, who was killed decades ago in New York City. We still to this, to this day are not sure if Victor thought it was John Lennon or Vladimir Ilyich Lennon, I'm joking. <laughs> but he said, of course. Um, but I remember, um, you know, Benazir Bhutto would come in and talk to us, E.L. Doctorow, Joan Didion, um, Ta-Nehisi Coates, um, you know, people from all across the world in the country, Jesse Jackson, and it was a chance to just be part of this journalistic enterprise that has survived and thrived, that is very different than almost any other. And um, it was a time of, uh, you know, we, we live today with, as I said, times of heartbreak and, um, but it was, uh, it was a fascinating, time when uh, Amy was there and then Layla who did such extraordinary work. But let me introduce Amy because she's probably at this moment, um, I don't wanna say respected because that sounds sober, but she is a writer about Haiti. She has made Haiti her country, her beat. I was looking in the intermission of about, we published, I believe it was 90, Amy. I don't know, it was called The Father it was about Aristide. And Amy has come to know the country, the people. And she's um, award-winning author of Farewell Fred Voodoo, A Letter from Haiti, The Rainy Season, Haiti Since Duvalier. She's also written about the Middle East and it was based in Israel with her husband, Nick Goldberg, who was there, I think for Newsday or the LA Times, forgive me, Martyrs Crossing. I feel earthquakes more often than they happen. This was about coming to California in the age of Schwarzenegger. Uh, she's a McDowell Fellow. She's the former Jerusalem correspondent for the New Yorker, as I said, contributing editor and the winner of the prestigious Whiting Writers Award, the Penn Martha Albron Nonfiction Award. And she won the 2013 National Book Critics Circle Award for Memo for Farewell. Uh, so many awards. And she writes, she's our correspondent. Uh, but she writes for the New Yorker, the LA Times, the Washington Post, and many other publications. But I like to think that she got her start as an intern, as did a thousand other now journalists, writers, thinkers, who are part of both the ma mainstream and sort of subterranean journalistic community. Leila Alaryan uh, is an Emmy and Peabody award-winning journalist and the executive producer of Fault Lines, a documentary program on Al, Al Jazeera English. She's co-author with Chris Hedges of Collateral Damage, America's War Against Iraqi Civilians. And the book is based on their extraordinary, remember your work on it, Leila, just so diligent, uh, rigorous, and the, uh, called The Other War. It was a 2007 nation investigative special project, uh, which was selected as one of Project Censored's. If you don't know that award, it's worth checking it out. 25 most important undercovered news stories of 2008. Uh, she 
graduated from uh, Columbia's Journalism School, and her work has appeared in The Independent, The Guardian, UPI, Alternate. So thank you both for bringing us the span of uh, nation internship life. Um, I wanted to begin with Amy. Um, just a basic question to both of you. How did each of you begin working on the beats, so to speak, in which I would submit you have become expert? And you know, how did you develop the knowledge, the sense, the sense of history, the contacts, the sources, the experience, indeed the confidence uh, to become international reporters? I start with Amy. Well, I, uh, you know, I lived on the Upper West Side, on the Upper Upper West Side near Columbia. And uh, at the time, um, a lot of people were living there who were refugees from Haiti. Uh, there was a dictatorship in Haiti. I mean, this is way old history. To me, it seems very alive even today, the Duvalier dictatorship. And, uh, and a lot of Haitians had come and the men in the families were tax cab drivers, mostly in New York. And they, they would gather on street corners and, and scream at each other about politics in Haiti, they weren't interested in politics in the United States, and they would be speaking Creole. And I had learned French in, uh, in high school and college. And um, so Haitian Creole is closely related to French and lots of African languages. And so I could understand them a little. And then uh, I began to see faintly in the New York Times that that Baby Doc Duvalier, the second in line of the Duvalier dictator's dynasty was about to fall in Haiti. And I thought, oh, that's kind of interesting. And then I read Graham Greene's novel, The Comedians, which is set in Papa Doc's Haiti, very, very rigid, uh, cruel dictatorship. And it's a very, very great novel. In fact, if anyone wants to read it, they ought to. Every journalist should read this book, um, as well as uh, The Quiet American by Graham Greene about Vietnam. And, uh, and I read that and I thought, oh, I have to go there. I must go there. And then I got the tapes from Indiana University that taught you Creole. And I started learning Creole on these tapes and I started reading the Haitian newspapers. And it was all about the fall of the dictatorship and how it was about to happen, about to happen, about to happen. And I thought, wow, if I don't get down there, I'm gonna miss it. I'll never have been there under Duvalier. I'll never have known what the Tonton Macoute were, the secret police of the Duvalier dictatorship. So I flew down and like a week later, he fell. And I was at the airport when he left and uh, with his wife, Cruella de Villing with her long cigarette holder and very chic soigné person. And they drove their BMW up into a US cargo plane mm -hmm. and flew off to Paris in their Luke's uh, exile. And um, of course I was hooked. And so I kept on going until I finally got a book contract. And then I went down to live there. And slowly um, I accrued um, through patience and love I accrued a lot of um, sources, whom, many of whom are still living, <laughs> some of whom have died in one manner or another. Many of them were older people who I talked to about history and Haitian politics, and so they died over the years. But, you know, new people are always coming into my world. And, um, and recently, with the assassination of President Moise, I continued. Um, finding new sources through Haitian social media because I couldn't go down uh, because of the kidnapping. Uh, I don't even know what to call it. Imbroglio, it's just a total world set right now in Haiti. Um, I couldn't go down there. It was way too dangerous and the COVID situation wasn't any much better either. So I did most of my reporting from the assassination through the uh, earthquake this past summer and onto maybe an establishment of a new government, we can only hope and uh, looking at the gangs through WhatsApp. And that's been a really interesting thing to do. And I've cultivated new sources. I've expanded some newish sources who I never knew if I would ever see again. Now they're really my friends. Um, and that's where all Haitian news is reported now. Uh, and I get you know the Haitian papers still that still exist. And that's kept me alive. But what's really kept me alive, not to sound like I'm an advertisement, but 
Don Guten plan has basically let me write what I need to write when I need to write it more as though we have a relationship than that I'm begging him for space. It's as though I'm supporting the nation while the nation is supporting me. And I felt extremely grateful for that, oh, almost to the point of getting tears in my eyes right now. Oh. And uh, it's become a paper that's very important in Haiti now. I mean, people look at the nation because I'm writing in the nation about Haiti and they consider that one of the American voices uh, writing about Haiti, one of the platforms for Haitian coverage and one of the places they can hear an alternative to the New York Times and the rest of the mainstream media and where I can be brutal, which I appreciate also. Amy, um, thank you. I wanted to ask you, you said um, something about love, which is unusual in terms of foreign correspondence. Haiti is um, an extraordinary country, but it's also multi-layered suffering, grief. People look and just turn away sometimes because it's so much. Yeah. How have you, um, how have you found a way, you'd never be jaded, but how have you found a way to stay with the story? I'm jaded all the time. I, I know you jaded. are in other areas, but not no, this No, in one. Haiti, I'm jaded. Yeah. Like, you know, they say about Haiti, when you arrive, you have a million stories you want to tell. And, you know, three days later, you have two stories you want to tell. And two Next. weeks later, you don't want to say anything. And it's the way, you know, they have these jitneys in Haiti that everybody talks about. They're called tap taps. They're really brightly colored. Even people who've never heard of Haiti have sometimes seen pictures of these little uh, collective buses, we call them. And uh, by the time you've been there for four weeks, you don't even see them anymore. So I do get a little jaded sometimes. But uh, what's really kept me involved, I think, is both my friends there and, and how much I care about them and their future and their ability to have a country. Right. But also, um, you know, I was reading the paper the other day, the paper, the New York Times, and I got yeah. to the uh, paragraph where they said poverty stricken Haiti, blah, blah, blah. Usually they say the world, the hemisphere's poorest nation that makes Haitians go absolutely bad, crazy. And so I was thinking, well, what words could we really use? Let's, let's think of something instead of poverty stricken. So I thought, how about uh, debased, rejected, cruelly treated? How about uh, eliminated from the world's economy? How about exploited and desecrated? Those would be more appropriate words than poverty stricken, which implies that poverty has somehow arrived in Haiti on its own on high. Every, from on high to torture this black nation. And it makes me just insane when I consider the absolutely heroic, though not by now debased, um, history of this revolutionary nation that is, you know, whose revolution was yet more incredible than the French Revolution, and not much more bloody, by the way. And just to say, I mean, someone once said you're as good as your sources. I mean, you have different, you have people too. I mean, so often the sourcing. Anyway, but Layla, forgive me. I, same, same frame of question, if I could, yeah. So I grew up mostly as a consumer of news being Palestinian, you know, we sort of live and breathe politics. So the news was always, you know, in the background. Back then it was the nightly news. Um, and then over time it became cable news. And even though I would see images from, you know, the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, um, young people throwing rocks at, at massive um, tanks, uh, I didn't feel like the news coverage actually informed or enlightened anyone. So, and I realized from a pretty young age that just because a story is receiving a lot of coverage doesn't mean that people actually learn anything about it. So, you know, over the years, polls have shown that Americans actually think that it's the Palestinians who are illegally occupying Israeli land instead of the reverse. And I realized just the power of the media and shaping narratives and perspectives. And I wanted to be a part of it. I was also very nosy. And I love to write. And it was like, as you hear from a lot of journalists, it kind of ticks all the boxes. And, um, you know, fast forward many years, and I graduated from college and the Iraq war happened. And I wanted to be there. I wanted to cover Iraq. I spoke Arabic. I felt like I had something uh, to give to contribute. And, you know, for a number of reasons, that wasn't possible. And instead, I was in Washington, D.C., covering rat infestation in restaurants and graffiti on walls and community meetings. <laughs> 
and, you know, sort of bored out of my mind, but also kind of respecting the fact that I was learning how to be a reporter. Mm -hmm. And then I came to the nation and that was my chance. I finally got the chance to actually cover Iraq. And it wasn't by going there. It was by speaking to the veterans who came here, um, who had a lot to say, but who weren't heard, not only by their fellow Americans, but by the mainstream media that didn't really have any interest in hearing about war crimes in Iraq. So with Chris Hedges, we interviewed 50 Iraq war veterans about what they'd seen, what they experienced and what they've done, what they'd done themselves. And it was, you know, very horrific, uh, vivid testimony about war crimes against Iraqi civilians, the indiscriminate killing of of Iraqis, whether through um, the convoys they were traveling in, the check checkpoints that were set up, sometimes not more than, than a few rocks that they called a checkpoint, and then there were checkpoint shootings, um, as well as the raids they were conducting in, in homes of Iraqis, the detentions of uh, Iraqis, especially men, um, many of them for months at a time, their families didn't know where they were. We also looked at the racism that was kind of undergirding a lot of, of the violence. And the fact that, again, these veterans would come back and there was this resounding sort of silence. I mean, they would see people with the yellow ribbon saying support our troops and they would actually feel a lot of anger and frustration saying people don't want to hear what actually happened. They don't want to hear the, the story that, uh, in fact, we weren't there for any real reason. And, you know, I'm so grateful to the nation, not only for giving me this opportunity as an intern <laughs> to do this amazing work, but also for telling that story. When, when the story came out, um, there, there's a reason Project Censored called it one of the top 25 censored stories. Nobody in the mainstream media, with the exception of Bob Herbert and the New York Times, wanted to cover it. Mm -hmm. NBC News said they were sending out a crew to interview um, me and Chris to talk to some of the veterans in the article, and then it was canceled with no explanation. And, you know, I would hope that in 2021, there's more willingness to kind of look back at this horrific time in our history, but I'm not sure it's any better. And I just remember coming to the nation and really fe feeling like this is one of the few bright lights in the media, a place that courageously took a stance against the Iraq war when there was such groupthink in the media, when in fact, um, the New York Times was actually, you know, through Judy Miller and others, were actually laundering um, yeah. discredited intelligence to, um, you know, in order to, to, to grow support for the war. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's sort of where my start in journalism came. Then over the years, I moved into documentary and have done other work. Mm -hmm. but. Thank you, Lila. Both of you talked about the media. Um, you know, media malpractice, maybe not going that far. Um, I'm interested, I mean, Amy, I know you write for all kinds of media, but it's, I'm, I'm interested in how you, you mentioned earlier, you, you fight for space. I mean, what, what's different about writing for the nation? But I'm also interested in, um, this is maybe more political advocacy, but one's always honest, someone once said, you know, honest, about the, you, you can't make up your own facts, you can have your opinion. But those in power, as we see from like the Pentagon Papers or the Afghan Papers, they know the truth. And we're all, you know, we're trying to bring truth to power. Those in power know the truth. Do you think, Layla, picking up on what you said that there's been a change? You talked about all the noise, but people aren't really learning. Do you see change? in the media to a certain extent since 2003, six, talking about lessons from Iraq, lessons from Afghanistan, lessons from Haiti. I think for me, the game changer has been social media. I think now our peace in the nation, despite the media blackout, would have potentially gone viral on Twitter. People would have picked up on it. The mainstream media would have been forced to take a look at it and maybe do their own investigation. So I do think social media has been a game changer, has changed a lot in terms of democratizing media a bit more. I do think little by little, as the media kind of becomes more diverse and you have kind of different perspectives, things are changing. But, uh, and, I, and I do think the younger generation now, the generation that says we should be allowed to go out and, and, and say Black Lives Matter. Why is that taken as a political position to say that Black people shouldn't be killed? Uh, by police. Um, there is a bit of a shift in thinking, but I also try not to be too optimistic because. Yeah. 
you know, the, the you know the the powers that be constantly give us, uh, you know, reason to to sort of also scratch our head, especially when it comes to I think imperialism, when it comes to militarism, I think there tends to be um, across the divide in media, like kind of the same perspectives. And Amy, yeah. you mentioned. I mean, it sometimes seems as if journalists, not all, have a key on their computer, the poverty-ridden Haitians. You know, it's like the mandatory. Right. Right. Well, you know, one of the things I've noticed recently, I feel that, uh, and I can't tell if it's just that I've been doing it for so long, but I feel more credited by the mainstream media than I have before. I mean, I could always maybe sneak an op-ed piece in um, to one of the mainstream papers. And I always try to do that, not you know, it used to be because I wanted my name in the Washington Post or the New York Times for my own benefit, but now it's really about Haiti and getting the message out and, and you know, and trying to actually pressure the Biden administration yes. to move in a different way from the Trump administration. And I think that, that we've put a lot of pressure on them and I feel that, um, having written a piece about how ignored Haiti was on the day before Moise was assassinated mm. um, in the nation. Don just said, go ahead, write it. I wrote it. It was, a, I really think, a strong piece. Yes. And there it was sitting there like a target when he was killed. No one else had written about Haiti in three years. So that made a difference. And the reason it was seen, Layla's exactly right, was it was on social, social. media. Yeah. So the nation put it up a lot. I put it on Twitter. Um, it was all over the place. And then all of media saw it. And right. then, you know, of course it was an Amy Fest briefly, but then the ideas in it were also, uh, you know, distributed more widely than I've ever seen them done. And I think that there's a lot of synergy between progressives on the left in Haiti, and I'm sure in other countries that the nation covers, and nation coverage and then wider coverage because the nation provides that platform for me to expand the progressive voices in Haiti. Amy, you're you said something wonderful to my ears. You said the nation's known because of you, but if that's through social media, I mean, people are reading you. Yeah, obviously. well, it's of course, it's a certain class of Haitians. But right? no, but it's still people in their country are reading. Democrats, little d Democrats in that country are reading the nation because they speak English. Oh, by the way, you guys are owed some money by various outlets in Haiti because they translate me like crazy into French and never, well, you know, you get I've it. never seen a dime. <laughs> I'm so but, um, excited to be translated. So I know you're going to, uh, we'll open it up, but I wanted to ask um, you one more question, Amy, about um, do you, I mean, is the coverage, it's, it doesn't speak to the people. I mean, you said small D Democrats. You, are, you have developed sources and friends and other contacts and now social media over the years. So if you sat down with um, the person who's the pers point person in the Biden administration, you would show your journalism, but you would speak in a very different way, I suspect, than how Haiti is spoken of in Washington or policy circles. Oh yeah, and I feel that I'm speaking to them all the time when I'm writing in the nation. I feel yeah. that that, I always like to think, and I'm sure Lila does too, about who is my audience who I'm writing for right now and why. And my audience since January 7th when Moise was killed is primarily the State Department. That's who I care about right now because it's still the same old same like that in the yes. world and they're still very important. And so I want to, you know, make change influence change. Yeah. Make, Layla, could you talk a little bit about fault lines? And, and interesting that you've moved to a video. I'm video fused with social media, obviously, presence. Yeah, when you mentioned um, our project turned into a book, it was 2008. I was at the age of 25, I'd co-authored a book and I thought, oh, sky's the limit. I can get any job in journalism now. And it was at a time when our industry was hemorrhaging jobs. <laughs> And it's it's funny to think that at the time, you know, I'd, I'd done a print concentration at Columbia, and of course, print was was dying, you know, a long death after the internet. 
um, except for the nation. But um, so I actually went where where people were hiring and it was Al Jazeera English. Um, they had a big office in DC and I started out working kind of in the broadcast center there. And I'm now the executive producer of Fault Lines, which is an investigative documentary show on Al Jazeera English um, that airs monthly. And um, we cover either stories in the US, criminal justice, police brutality, education, health, labor, or if they're abroad, they have to have a strong US connection. So a strong, usually line of accountability, whether it's government or corporate. And uh, you get good support, Al Jazeera is always, uh, it hasn't been in the news as much and it didn't get battered, I don't think, with foreign agent res registration. Yeah, thankfully, thankfully, Ted Cruz and others were and, and, and the UAE lobbying were sort of trying to get it um, to register as a foreign agent. But luckily, they were able to avoid that. But, you know, I think there's a lot of similarities in sort of the editorial line and the ethos yes. between the nation and fault lines, which is holding uh, power to account, amplifying undercovered voices, um, you know, and, and underreported uh, stories. And yeah. Um, so any tips for, I mean, Amy's, if I'm going to disclose, before we joined you, I was talking to Amy about her youngest son, Noah, who just broke a big story in the Daily News, which, you know, the, this city, New York, used to have 12 papers. It has, I don't consider, forgive me, the New York Post a sort of real newspaper, but the Daily News is. And it was a story, uh, investigative piece, which he pulled together on. Uh, but do you, tips for young reporters? Did you give your son tips, Amy and Layla? Are you, um, your example is probably one of the great examples for young journalists looking. I'm thinking, did I give my son tips? By the yes. way, his name, ah. his name is not the you same gave as him mine. The tip to that. You covered Washington, you covered New York for a while, didn't you? I covered Long Island, much harder to cover than New York. Um, by the way, his name is Noah Goldberg. He has a different last name for me, just for you listeners. Um, no, I give him no tips. He's a far better reporter than I am because he can, you know, whip a story out of I don't know where. And he gets all his sources and he lines them up and and he covers criminal justice, which has documents that are working. I mean, OK, he also has an easier job in some ways than I had in Haiti. I really had to live in Haiti uh, to develop sources because at the time it was a way more oral culture. Uh, right. A documentation was not something they liked because of uh, years of corruption, you know, if you didn't have a document, that was better than if you did have a document. Um, so that was hard. And then during the earthquake, the um, archives fell down and were destroyed. So that was another thing in Haiti. You couldn't do that kind of research after the earthquake of 2010. Um, so everything was was personal. And, um, and of course, sourcing is really very personal anyway. But, you know, the way facts can be definitely pinned down if you have a document, a legal document, a historical document that asserts it. It was harder to do in Haiti. There's more, um, it's a very interpretive beat, let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. I don't know if Layla has that same feeling about what she's covered. Yeah, I think uh, it really depends on the on where you're going and kind of, uh, I, for us at Fault Lines, I think working with some local journalists has been key to really understanding the place. But Amy, you, you actually picked up your life and moved there. Um, and thanks for mentioning no, I just followed him on Twitter. I'll uh, <laughs> be so glad, really. Yeah, yeah. I think for me, I mean, for any tips for young people, I think it's just being flexible. Our field is so, um, it can be, it can feel very erratic and it can feel very unstable. And I think for me, I always imagine myself being a foreign correspondent, maybe in the Middle East, writing for a major magazine or newspaper. And um, I had to kind of go where people were hiring and where I felt like I could be myself and I can do good work. And I think just being open-minded and flexible about how you can do the journalism that you want to do and also being really grounded in your own principles. For me, mm -hmm. it's holding power to account. It's um, amplifying undercovered voices. It's making sure pers different perspectives are reflected and really just knowing what it is that's important to you and making sure that that grounds you. I wanted to add one more thing about the new world of journalism, which is that yeah. uh, Don Gutenplan, the editor of The Nation, is very kind to me in letting me appear in The Nation. But let's just point out that he has been liberated as so many have 
by the space on the internet yeah. so that I can write for the nation, much to Don's horror, I can write five, five pages, words. You know, 5,000 words, and I can do that. I can put that can. overnight. <laughs> um, and if it had to go in the print magazine, I probably wouldn't get into the print magazine as often as I can get onto the website. And that has been crucial. And then, of course, as we all know, the website is immediately translatable into social media, right. and it just makes the flow of information. Uh, it's more accessible and it's more widespread. And I'm very grateful for that, even though I'm old enough to care about the uh, literal the magazine and to whine to Don all the time, like, when are you going to put me in the paper paper? You know, so we really. have some great questions, but I want to say I'm, I'm most really interested in, Amy, your sense and Layla's sense of the, the upside of social media and also the internet, which I, I agree with for the most part, because we hear so much about disinformation and the, right now it's the downside of social media. And I also love the internet because I think we travel globally and all over. I mean, we're not confined by the number of uh, subscriptions, but monetizing it is very hard. <laughs> yeah. Just want to share with everyone on the call. It's, uh, it's tough, but we care, we care more about impact and mission than profit. And I will take that back immediately, but that's yeah, what we Exactly. Care. She didn't mean that, everyone. She <laughs> didn't mean that. But thank you. I'm going to turn you over to Aaron. We have some great questions, and I'm very grateful for your time, both. Hi. Yes, thank you so much for your time. And I, I want to let everybody in our audience know we have time for more questions. So if you have any, please put them in the Q&A or in the chat. Um, and I'll start with the first question for you, Amy. It's from Ethel McDonald. Um, Amy, as a loyal supporter of Paul Farmer and the Partners in Health, I'm interested in your opinion of Paul, including his book on Haiti after the earthquake. Thank you for your inspiring comments. Well, that's very nice. Um, just turning off my phone. Uh, so my feelings about Paul Farmer, well, I've known Paul Farmer for a long time. I spoke about love. Yes, I would say I love Paul Farmer as a colleague, as a person who's worked in Haiti, um, as an international hero who's uh, really done a huge amount for healthcare. Um, he's had stumbling blocks in Haiti. Of course, it's very difficult to do big things in Haiti. And right after the earthquake, he uh, ended up building his big hospital, which is very important. It's a teaching hospital and it teaches Haitian doctors in Haiti, in Mirbalé, and but it was hard to do, and it's hard to keep staffed, and it's hard to keep uh, supplied, and you know it's awfully difficult. But he tries to do it, and I really admire that because you know some people just give up and throw up their hands and say we can't do this here, it's too much of a wreck, we're moving out, and uh, so I really admire Paul for that, and I. Um, you know, they, he only has one big problem, and that is he's a big white man, you know, so that's always a little difficult thing. You don't want to be the big white man savior of a country that is that should be a big black nation and doesn't get to be for various historical reasons. But uh, he's always humble and decent and and good. I mean, what can I say about Paul? <laughs> he's the best kind of example of outsider behavior in Haiti. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, this question for both of you, it's from Amber Castillo. Could you speak to navigating the shift away from international slash US based journalists and toward having local journalists cover stories abroad when you want to also lend your unique reporter lens to those stories, but still supporting this shift? Mm -hmm. Isn't Layla? Yeah, we could start with Layla. Well, as I mentioned at Fault Lines, um, we do always work with local journalists when we're, you know, going to another country and, um, you know, that local perspective, the contacts is so important and we credit all the local journalists and everything we do. And I just think it adds so much as far as the context, the nuance in a story. Um, and, you know, I support that in, in any way, you know, I support the shift. Um, I think it can be tough for people um, to get published in US outlets um, from another country. And I also think there continues to be um, misconceptions about people being biased when they're covering their own country that I think hopefully there's, there's become a little bit more of a shift in that thinking. But I can tell you, for example, um, 
you know, there's a there's a perception among Palestinians that if a Palestinian works for the New York Times, they're automatically going to be considered biased unless they prove otherwise. Um, so I think when it comes uh, to specific topics, um, th there tends to be a perception uh, more than others. But, you know, I do welcome this shift. Um, I, I just wanted to say one more thing to that, you know, in in Haiti, as in many other countries, there is no um, no real belief that objectivity is the goal. The, there's much more political sense about journalism as there is in France. And I think it's in, in Haiti, it's inherited from France where you have the Figaro on the right and the Monde in the progressive camp, you know, and, and many other outlets, each one with its own known point of view, as opposed to these massive mainstream things that pretend to, uh, be objective while they're really, you know, on the side of the status quo, let's put it that way. Um, so when you're working with journalists in Haiti, um, you have to watch for this, uh, the slanted view and then um, help them and, and you yourself not correct for it, but get phrase it so that it's not, uh, frightening to readers of objective media. And I think that's very hard. And one of my big pushes has been to get Haitian commentators into English language papers, which is, as I'm sure Leila knows, getting foreign writers into Anglo papers is difficult. And I, so I've been translating and that's really been a blast, you know, saying to someone, oh, I saw your piece on WhatsApp from Radio Caraib and I want to translate it and let's let's try and push it and get it somewhere. Um, and that's fun. And I think it's a way, I mean, there's so many Haitian Americans who are absolutely fluent in, uh, in English, but they're not necessarily that interested in writing about Haiti for the international media. So uh, I've been trying to get Haitians into that and that's fun. Thank you. Um, Amy, I know you have to leave at quarter of and I wanna be yeah. respectful of your time. We have so many questions, but let me just get, um, this one in for you. Can you suggest some books that people could read to get a better understanding of Haiti and um, what is the maybe the base the best history in English? There is uh, Laurent Dubois who wrote a book called Avengers of the New World, and it's kind of um, a, a new and revised uh, uh, Black Jacobins, which is C.L.R. James's great book about the Haitian Revolution. I think it's really, really important for people to understand where Haiti comes from, why it is what it is, why it's been treated the way it's been treated throughout its history because of its revolutionary status and its uh, victory over imperialism by an enslaved population uh, very way too early on for world history to accept. So there's that. And I was thinking of one more book that's really, really good. I mean, there are so many. Well, I would say The Comedians by Graham Greene for fun, but maybe not for education so much, but it teaches you about the Duvalier regime, which is a very important thing. Um, there's about to be a new book out by Jonathan Katz, my colleague who came out of the AP and was working for the AP during the earthquake and wrote one great book, which is called The Yellow Truck That Went By. I believe that's what it's called. Uh, about the earthquake, but he's coming out with another book about Smedley Butler, who was the head of the Marine occupation. There was an actual United States occupation of Haiti um, from 1915 through 1929. I always get the dates wrong. It might be 1934. And, um, and Jonathan's written a biography of this incredible guy who just so, told so many truths about the occupation after and even sometimes during um, during the occupation. So that's another great book that's going to be. Thank you. We have a question from uh, Paul Gordon for both of you. Uh, what are the most important hard skills to have as a foreign correspondent? And Layla, maybe you could start. Sure. Um, I think uh, one obvious one is language. So as much as you can learn a different language that you can apply yeah, it just enriches the reporting so much to be able to communicate with the people you're interviewing directly in their language. Um, I think asking, um, you know, curiosity, asking uh, tough questions, I think especially showing skepticism of official claims. 
uh, too many journalists kind of take, um, especially US government or intelligence claims at face value mm -hmm. instead of actually questioning that. And I think we're seeing more and more skepticism when it comes to police accounts, for example, um, in the criminal justice <laughs> in criminal justice coverage, when you see uh, video footage directly contradicting official police accounts. And I think we need to express that same kind of skepticism when it comes to foreign policy and when it comes to US government claims, intelligence claims, because um, I think that lack of skepticism, unfortunately, is what um, tars a lot of foreign coverage. Um, I could answer a little bit about the language thing. It's very good to be able to talk to the people you're interviewing in their language, obviously. So it can't be beat. I have had translators who translate for me from Creole, and I speak Creole, and they'll go, <laughs> they'll just turn from the person who is speaking in Creole, and they'll turn to me and say it in Creole. And I'm like, where's my translation? Because it, it's a very complicated thing, translation. Um, but not only do you want to know what the person you're interviewing says, and this is what you can really do, Lana. I can do it pretty well, but not always. You want to eavesdrop. Eavesdropping is key to journalism. You want to hear, while you're talking to this person, you want to hear what the general at the next table is saying. And if you don't speak the language, that's a lost, that's like, he might as well not be there. Um, and then the other thing I think that young journalists need to know to do, especially those who've sort of come up through the pandemic on Zoom. Go and look, go and look, do gumshoe reporting. Even foreign correspondents have to do gumshoe reporting, go into the shanty town, go talk to the head of the gang, go talk to the people who are suffering in the streets with the garbage and know what their lives are like. Even if you're not reporting a story on it, you know, do the anthropological, I know it's a demeaned area of study now, but do the study of man that helps you understand what is the, the global situation you're working in. Could I just say on the 150th of the nation, there was a film by Barbara Koppel and it followed Amy as one of four journalists and it showed her reporting in Haiti and going to talk. I'm still trying to get the the out clips of that film for myself oh, because they are even better this than this afternoon. I'll, I'll work on it, but it was a, worth seeing. You, um, yeah. I think we can maybe get one more question in for uh, Amy or Katrina. Yeah, I could say for one more question. I'm so sorry, Lila, to do this to you, to sort of bundle me up at the beginning. Yeah, I I love hearing everything you're saying. So. Like. Uh, we have a question from Zuri Pope, and I, I want to let you all know that Zuri is one of um, the Nation Fund for Independent Journalism's writing fellows, the, the, our first writing fellowship of what will be many. Uh, Zuri writes uh, to both Amy and Layla, and we will start with Amy. Um, what do you think is the cause for the homogeneity of thought in mainstream press regarding US foreign policy? Is it casual racism, laziness on the part of most foreign correspondents, or something else entirely? Well, in Haiti, there's a, just a tremendous uh, oppressive amount of casual racism. Um, and a lot of the reporting that a reporter could get, say, say they're reporting on US policy toward Haiti and they're based in Washington, what they're getting from the State Department in Washington is coming to the State Department from the embassy in Port-au-Prince. And right now and almost forever since I've been there and before I was ever there, the embassy in Port-au-Prince is a desperately awful um, nest of racism and, um, and poor policy. I mean, some people are trying, obviously, but I have to be fair to them. And I'm hoping that that will change soon, but even right up until today, awful. Um, so people rely on this. These, you know, they rely, reporters rely on people who speak English. So that's a problem. So that's one reason for dependence on the State Department. And it's just, you're scared. Um, so many mainstream reporters are scared to say something that doesn't comport with the State Department line because the State Department line is probably true, they think. And why would they really question that? And will they get in trouble? What if they're wrong? Well, if they're wrong, they can say, but the State Department said. Whereas if they're wrong because they told some Haitian version of the truth, and the State Department says, well, that's not true, they're gonna to have to do a lot of work to prove that it's not true, not that it is true, sorry. 
to prove the other people's line. Uh, thank you. Um, we can I'm, move I'm gonna go now and I really thank appreciate you, Amy. the opportunity to talk to everyone. And, uh, and of course my thanks go to the nation as usual. All right, bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, Layla, um, we'll turn to you for the same question. Can, do you have thoughts on um, how the mainstream press is uh, covering foreign policy? Sure, I mean, I would say, particularly when it comes to the Middle East, I think it's a lot of reporters have a lot of blind spots um, that figure into their coverage. And I think a lot of times editors don't ask tough questions that they would ask, especially when it comes to domestic coverage. Um, you know, you can get away with a lot. Um, you know, I think one example that comes to mind is Rukmini Kalamaki, who was the New York Times' um, terrorism cover, uh, reporter. She didn't speak Arabic. Um, she didn't particularly have any specialization in the Middle East and Islam and anything, but became the expert. And um, I think many of her sources were people in the terrorism industry, um, which has, you know, there have been a lot of articles written about how the terrorism industry kind of um, is is unreliable, is error prone, um, relies on you know either false or or misleading characterizations, and you know her podcast Caliphate was discredited a year ago, and the New York Times had to completely retract it because it was based on the testimony of someone who made the whole thing up. And I think in, in the case of this podcast, this was a young uh, Canadian Muslim uh, Pakistani man who. Um, made up the, the whole story of joining ISIS. And I think a lot of the problems with foreign reporting in general, um, you know, appeared in sort of this debacle, which is a lack of skepticism uh, to claims, um, you know, I think uh, relying, like basically sort of confirmation bias. So um, in, in the court case, because this man was charged with kind of making up uh, the whole story by Canadian authorities who's charged with the hoax, it came out that he said the reporter kind of pushed him to talk about violence that he made up. So, um, you know, this is sort of a, a sad and glaring example of all of these problems. She also interviewed um, Yazidi women, underage Yazidi girls who'd been raped by, um, you know, ISIS members and did so in a way that I think um, it, you, you can argue, you know, some people, some academics have said um, was unethical. And again, would we talk to rape victims in the US in the same way? I don't think so. So there's a lot of double standards when it comes to foreign reporting that would absolutely not apply here. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from Zuri Pope and it's a good time for this question. Who are some journalists whose work and coverage of Palestine you would recommend others follow? Well, one of them is the nation's new Palestine correspondent, I think the first ever. And, and um, you know, not only for the nation, but for any American publication, uh, Muhammad Al-Kurd. Um, you know, I think uh, I'm going to give a, a, you know, conflict of interest, but my sister Lema um, Alarian, who works for Vice, actually did two incredible documentaries, one on the Sheikh Jarrah um, protests and um, expulsions that happened earlier this summer um, that went viral actually on social media for Vice and the other one about the attacks on Gaza. So they went in after um, the horrific war and, and interviewed some survivors and some people who lost loved ones. Um, but yeah, that's a great question. I think there's a lot of obviously Amira Haas and Gideon Levy are two kind of um, amazing, incredible Israeli journalists who do really good work um, for the Israeli media. Erin, might I ask Layla a question about her New York Times op-ed, um, the essay for the New York Times, I think you wrote it this past May about your grandfather. And it was very, very moving. And um, you wrote that this, the story of his life can be told through all of the homes that he has lost. Can you say a little more? Yeah, and sure. And what the, what the reception was? Well, um, in May, when Israel was bombarding Gaza, um, I awoke, you know, woke up to see the news that they actually destroyed um, a residential building that was also had some commercial offices, including the uh, headquarters for Al Jazeera English, as well as Associated Press. And I was just horrified to see this building kind of blown to bits so quickly. Um, you saw there was a kind of a viral video of the building owner pleading with Israeli authority, the Israeli military, please, like, can you just give us 10 more minutes so people can bring their stuff out? 
And, you know, I was horrified enough when I knew that it was my colleagues and other journalists and, and obviously regular people living in there who had to escape, who lost their homes. And then a couple of hours later, I found out from my brother that my grandfather had an apartment in that building and that it was really the one thing that he left for his kids to inherit. And I realized just thinking about it, not only was this a, you know, a political tragedy, kind of an outrageous act against journalism, against, you know, innocent people, but it also once again hit home. And I think I started to think about my grandfather's life as a Palestinian refugee who was, um, you know, who lost his land um, when Israel became a state in 1948, that throughout his life, he lost so many homes because of different actions by the Israeli government, whether it was having to leave Gaza in search you know, of work and another life in the 50s to um, 67, when the 67 war happened, Israel decreed that any Palestinian that wasn't living in Gaza at the time basically lost their residency rights. So he was never, never able to go back. And then finally he was able to go back, but it was only because he became a US citizen. So it took him getting US citizenship for him to go back to Gaza. And during that time from about 2009, when he moved back until his death 11 years later, he lost so many different homes and, and Israeli bombardments. So there was a piece of land where he was growing, you know, vegetables and trees that was bombed with white phosphorus um, in 2014. And then, you know, on and on and on. And even in, de in death, he lost his apartment. What was the reaction? I'm just curious if you got a strong uh, differentiated reactions? For the most part, they were pretty supportive. I think people are not used to hearing such a personal account from a Palestinian. You know, I went back uh, to the creation of the state of Israel and how my grandmother had to walk for days from Jaffa to, um, to Gaza, uh, you know, similar to the Trail of Tears, you know, if you think about our own history. And so for the most part, I think people felt like, especially Palestinians felt like this is a very familiar story, but I think non-Palestinians felt like it was move, a moving account of one family story. And then of course you had kind of really odd hostile reaction. Someone said, you know, are we supposed to feel bad for a landlord? <laughs> and, you know, some anti-Palestinian comments as well, but you know, that's to be expected, especially on social media. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you know, we've we've talked a bit about um, the problems with media outlets and coverage and some reporting. Um, so in light of those problems, how do reporters establish trust with the people that they interview when they've got reasons to be skeptical of U.S. reporters and American media outlets? And Layla, especially with the veterans, yeah. I mean, must have been a difficult process to gain trust. It was interesting. So I did most of them on the phone and I think those were pretty seamless because they didn't know what I looked like. Most of them, I don't think knew I was Muslim and they mm. just wanted someone to listen who wasn't a family member. They over and over again, they would tell me, I can't talk to my girlfriend about this, or I can't, you know, I can't go to Thanksgiving and talk about these horrific war crimes. So they really felt like this was an outlet to just tell their stories. And then um, when I did a couple in, in, in person, when they saw that I was Muslim, one guy just walked away. He was like, I'm not doing this and just left. And then another guy just started weeping and just said, every time I speak to a Muslim, I feel guilty. And mm -hmm. he was just so haunted by what he'd done. And, and he felt like it was cathartic for him in a way. Um, but I think first and foremost, it's really giving the person you know, making them feel comfortable by just listening to what they have to say and being really interested in what they have to say and asking thoughtful follow-up questions. And like I said, I think it's always important for us to check our intentions. Like, why am I doing what I'm doing? Why am I telling this story? We tell, um, Katrina, as you mentioned at the beginning, we tell, we tell very tough stories, very heart-wrenching stories. And one thing I've started talking to my team about is you know, if we're doing a story where we're really asking people to pour their hearts out and talk about very traumatic events, whether it's losing a family member in a mass shooting or in a police shooting or whatever it is, that we're not going to use, we're not going to do any interview unless we know we're going to use it. Because so many people, especially when they're doing video interviews, will just talk to like 10 people and then the, some people won't make the cut. And this is something that we've really started talking more and more about, which is 
um, if if we're going to make someone go through that and then we're going to use it. So just being very discerning from kind of the pre interview pre production process to really know like okay this will make it in this won't make it in. Um, but it's tough. I think there's so much, especially with the Trump administration constantly calling everything fake news and putting a target on the back of journalists. I think it's been tough, really, in some circumstances, having the doors open because there's so much misinformation about what journalism is or what journalists do. Uh, thank you. We have a question from Paul Gordon. What do you think of gonzo journalism in, the, in an international context? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, I think if, if by gonzo journalism, he means like the Hunter S. Thompson kind of making yourself at the center of it. Um, I think, you know, it can be entertaining. Obviously there's a reason gonzo journalism had its moment, but I think, and I think sometimes it's effective, but I think for the most part, it can feel a bit like you're centering yourself and especially if you, for example, are a white person and you're going into, you know, another country, it can feel there can it can feel a bit like imperialist, or you're just parachuting in and kind of making yourself the center of, of the story. So generally, for for the work that I do, I'm more interested in centering kind of the people who have been impacted by the policy and hearing from them directly. Um, but it depends. I'd say I wouldn't like completely close the door, but I would just say it depends kind of on the context. Thank you. So at the, the Nation Fund for Independent Journalism, our mission is to, to educate uh, future journalists, bring uh, the next generations of journalists um, into an important field. And so we've got some of those people on this call. And I wonder if you have any practical advice for people who are right now working out their path and their beat and their voice. I would say, um, like I said earlier, keep an open mind because sometimes your dream path may not necessarily materialize, but another path will and kind of go where doors have been open, not to Fox News, but we're <laughs> open to you. And, you know, I think learning those hard skills that we talked about is really important. Um, and I think more and more as journalism becomes more digital and um, you know, multimedia kind of learning technical skills helps a lot, whether it's digital media skills or, or filming or editing, um, whatever skills you can pick up along the way, but really, um, you know, working hard, having a passion for the work and being open minded. Uh, that's really the key. And I think, you know, definitely don't be shy to kind of reach out to journalists you admire um, to have, you know, 10 minute chats about advice and how they got to where they are. Um, I got, you know, suggested as an intern at the nation by someone that I met who had been an intern at the nation 25 years earlier. And I went up to him at a conference and I said, you know, I really admire your work. And we kept in touch and he became sort of a mentor of sorts. And then years later suggested to me that I apply for the nation internship. So, you know, really networking, reaching out to people you admire and working really hard. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and with that, I will turn it to Katrina. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. And thank you so much, Layla. Um, I think if one needed um, a sense of the importance and the purpose of the Nation Internship Program, you uh, had it today with Layla and Amy. And I take away both the principled reporting you do and the historically informed reporting and the deep reporting, the committed reporting. So very grateful to you. This is, the fund is really to not only support the internship, but we had a great question or two questions from a first fellow, uh, I think Ziri. Um, but you're, um, you would be a great mentor, Layla. And as we try to reconstitute the internship as one of a community of principal journalists doing very different things, it would be great to be in touch with you. And I'm very grateful to all who've come on the call. I think uh, terrific questions and I just extraordinary answers. Um, but I hope people will support the fund because it's something uh, we've put real energy purpose into. And um, it's a tough world out there, but I think I come away and not just for the Thanksgiving meal where one hopes the nation provides inspiration and hope or at least answers to some crazy questions, but seriously, that. You come away with inspiration and hope after listening to you, Layla and um, Amy. And um, thank you very much. And may we uh, see each other at some point when things become more normal and 
Um, people who are interested in Layla's extraordinary investigative piece along with Chris uh, Hedges, maybe we can post it on the site and a few of Amy's pieces because it's a measure when you read of what you've heard today. Thank you everyone. And thank you, Layla. Thank you so much. Great to be here.